Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming. We're going to get started. Uh, everyone can keep getting food. Uh, we asked the people who are already seated if you guys could just move towards the middle of your sections so that people can easily find their seat after they get food. And also, please be cognizant of the camera in the back as you're in the back of the line, just because we are recording the session. All right, so thank you all for coming. And welcome to the final installment of the 2018 Last Lecture Series. Uh, as such, we want to give a few thank yous. First, this series has been in part sponsored by the Graduating Class Campaign, the GCC. And as you know, this year, students can give back to their student groups uh, with a small donation. So we ask that you consider giving back to the groups that made your Harvard experience a positive one. We also want to thank ITS, Information Technology Services, for all of their help in making sure all these events went on seamlessly. Uh, and finally, we want to thank all of our past lecturers, Alex Whiting, uh, Carol Steiker, and Jody Freeman, for participating. I mentioned that in the back after this session, we're going to have two posters, one for Professor Butler and one for Carol Steiker, and there'll be Sharpies. And we ask that on your way out, if you could just sign, I'd make a note, because that will be a gift that we're giving to Professor Butler and Professor Steiker after the session. So finally, uh, today we're here to close out our 2018 series with Paul Butler. Professor Butler is the Bennett Bosky Visiting Professor of Law, and we've been incredibly fortunate to have him this year from Georgetown, where he's the Albert Brick Professor in Law. Professor Butler has also taught at George Washington University Law School, where he received the Professor of the Year Award on three different occasions. Before teaching, Professor Butler graduated cum laude from Yale and then cum laude from Harvard Law School. He clerked for the Honorable Mary Johnson Lowe in the United States District Court in New York, and then he joined the fantastic law firm Williams & Connolly in Washington, D.C., where he specialized in white-collar criminal defense. He later served as a federal prosecutor with the U.S. Department of Justice, where he especially was public corruption. His prosecutions included a United States senator, three FBI agents, and several other law enforcement officials. Professor Butler researches and teaches in the areas of criminal law, race relations law, and critical theory. Students here know him from his 1L criminal law course, his upper level criminal procedure investigations course, and two other seminars, one on race, gender, and law, and one on Black Lives Matter and the law. His scholarship has been published in numerous journals, including the Harvard Law Review, Yale Law Journal, and UCA Law Review. And he's also the author of Let's Get Free, A Hip-Hop Theory of Justice, and just last year he authored Chokehold, Policing Black Men. About Chokehold, Judge Shira Scheinlin, who presided over the challenge to stop and frisk in New York, said, Paul Butler tells the unvarnished truth about the criminal justice system. He confronts just about everyone, police, prosecutors, judges, black elites, liberals, and radicals. A must read for those with a serious interest in criminal justice. As a former student in his criminal procedure course, I can say that I know just how engaging Professor Butler is in class and how he has a unique ability to elicit thought-provoking discussion on some of the most pressing issues in this country. He's also written in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, and is frequently consulted on issues of race and criminal justice. Like many of his students, I've had the cool experience of seeing him on MSNBC and other channels and saying, hey, that's my professor. So finally, uh, on behalf of the class marshals, we could not be more thrilled that Professor Butler has accepted our invitation to close out our series. So please join me in welcoming to the 2018 lecture series, Paul Butler. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm 12 years old, uh, growing up in Chicago. Martin Luther King said it was the most segregated city he had ever seen. I'm riding my bike to the library, which is literally on the other side of the tracks in the white neighborhood. After I cross the line, uh, a cop car pulls alongside me. Uh, the white police officer rolls down his window and asks, does that bike belong to you? Yes, I say. I, yes, it does. And then I ask him, does that car belong to you? <laughs> and I speed away. Well, when I, I get home, I tell my mom what I said. My mom, who, who 50 years ago this month used the meager savings we had to attend the funeral of Martin Luther King. My mom, who, 
who also took it to the streets with Malcolm X. When I told my mom what I said to that cop, she spanked me. Good. Didn't I know what happened to black boys who talked to the police like that? It, it was one of those spankings where the parent cries as much as the child. Now we know. During the time in Chicago when I talked back to the police, a police commander named John Berg was overseeing the torture of 118 African-American men. He had this crew, they're called the Midnight Squad, of police officers who coerced black men into making false confessions by sticking electrical devices up their rectums and pouring soda in their noses and burning them with irons. Uh, the city of Chicago has now spent more than $100 million investigating and compensating the victims. My mom was doing her best to educate me about the consequences of a black boy talking to the police like that. Except that three years ago, in Waller County, Texas, a black woman named Sandra Bland found out that you don't even have to be a boy. All you have to do is ask why the cops stopped you. And this year, in Sacramento, California, an African-American man named Stephen Clark found out that you don't even have to talk back. All you have to do is be holding a, a cell phone that your black body makes the police think is a gun. And then last week in Philadelphia, two African-American men found out that all you have to do is be sitting in a Starbucks. Last Friday, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, not far from where we gather today, a member of our community found out that all you have to do is be black and have a mental health crisis. And then, the people who are supposed to serve and protect you beat you up and try to block people from videoing it. Uh, there's a history here. A few years back, the Cambridge police arrested another black man, Harvard University professor Henry Louis Gates, after they'd investigated him for trespassing on his own front porch. President Barack Obama, HLS, HLS class of 1991, uh, he looked at that episode with Professor Gates and he called it like he saw it. He said, and I'm quoting, the Cambridge police acted stupidly. My friends, when the Cambridge police are called to help a person, naked on the street, and obviously in a state of mental health crisis, and the Cambridge police respond by beating him so badly that they leave a pool of blood on Massachusetts Avenue, let us recall the words of President Obama. The Cambridge police have acted stupidly and they must be held accountable. And, and we, my friends, when we see misogyny and transphobia and xenophobia and homophobia, we must call it for the evil that it is. Uh, we do not, and we should not, see white Harvard professors being arrested on their porches and dealing with intoxicated students, surely that's gotta be part of the job description of Cambridge police, right? Of any police in a town that has a large university campus. Uh, we do not, and we should not, see the police staining the streets 
with the blood of intoxicated white students. When it happens to students of color, we must call it, we must name it the white supremacy, the evil that it is. And we have to use our, our Harvard credentials and the blessings of this incredible education that I got here, that you got here, uh, to speak truth to power and to hold each other accountable. Uh, what an honor it is to deliver this, this last, last lecture. Uh, the words on the screen are from the poet Audre Lorde. She always described herself as a black lesbian feminist. And, and this is from her poem, these words on the screen are from her poem, A Litany for Survival, where she says, when we are loved, we are afraid love will vanish. When we are alone, we are afraid love will never return. And when we speak, we are afraid our words will not be heard nor welcomed. But when we are silent, we are still afraid. So it is better to speak, remembering we were never meant to survive. So uh, I didn't get to hear Professor Jody Freeman's last lecture a few weeks ago. But at the beginning of the school year, uh, I had the pleasure of hearing Professor Freeman give what you might call a first lecture uh, at the orientation of the 1L section that we both teach in, section 7. I see a number of members of section 7 here. Thank you for being here. Uh, Professor Freeman told the brand new law students that their admission to Harvard Law School came with the keys to the kingdom. And she encouraged the students to use those keys with grace. I got to tell you, when I first heard her say that, keys to the kingdom, I thought it might have been an overstatement, a little bit too grandiose. But, but then I, I thought about my classmates during the time that I was a student here. So my first year section included Elena Kagan, uh, Jeff Tubin, who was the CNN legal analysis. Uh, my, my graduating class included Professor Carol Steiker, <coughs> Professor Bill Rubenstein, who also teaches here, uh, Professor Elner Elhag, and my dear friend Jackie Berrien, who was the chair of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. That's just my, my class. The, the two L's and three L's, uh, when I was a one L, included Dean John Manning, Professor Annette Gordon-Reed, uh, Attorney General Loretta Lynch, the great civil rights lawyer Brian Stevenson, and my buddy, the, the brilliant uh, intersectional legal theorist, Kimberly Crenshaw. And, and then when we were three L's, Michelle Obama was a one L. Wonder what ever happened to her. <laughs> so, maybe there's something to this keys to the kingdom thing, huh? Look to your, your left and your right. Uh, 25 years from now, We'll be celebrating the same kinds of achievements from people in this room. Uh, I've been enormously impressed uh, by the law students that I've met here this year. And, and I'm elated at the opportunities that you'll have. Uh, at the same time, uh, I want to suggest that some responsibilities come with that privilege. So many excellent, wonderful, marvelous things are in store for you graduates of the class of 2018. 
and, and some bad things too. So I guess the, the main thing I want to do is to tell a story of something that happened to me that at the time felt like a catastrophe, uh, but turned out to be okay. So uh, I wasn't the most humble brother when I graduated from this great law school. Uh, I clerked after on a, for a federal judge in New York and, and then uh, took a, a job at a, a fancy law firm in, in DC. And, and sorry, Cameron, but I, I kind of hated it. <laughs> uh, I, I felt like I didn't go to law school to, to help the rich people and rich businesses who uh, that firm, who were that firm's clients, as great a firm as it is in terms of the quality of its work. But I, I had these huge law school loans, and, and I thought maybe I could make some progress paying them back at the firm. I, I didn't know quite how I was going to be able to do it. Three years of law school, and I owed so much money, $30,000. Oh, my God. <laughs> Trust me, at the time, it seemed, like, daunting. Uh, but I was able to make some, some headway. And, and then uh, I joined the United States Department of Justice as a federal prosecutor. Uh, imagine the feeling of stepping into a courtroom and saying, good afternoon, my name is Paul Butler and I represent the United States. Uh, I love that power. Uh, I represented the government in criminal court in the District of Columbia. I'm prosecuting a, a prostitute. And we're in a room a lot smaller life than this. It's kind of like a cell, even though it's a, a courtroom. It's where they do the, the non-jury cases in D.C. When lawmakers don't want you to have a jury trial, they just make the punishment less than six months. Uh, then you just get a judge, and judges are much more likely to convict than judges. So me and this judge, we're kind of like a team. We can do five or six. We call them whore cases. Uh, we could do five or six of these whore cases a day. So inside this little room are, are the sex worker, her court-appointed court defense attorney, a cop, The judge, me, and my mother. It's my mom's first time seeing me in trial, and I want to impress her. I, I don't know why she went to trial. Well, rule number one of sex workers in DC is plead your case. You plead because there's no defense other than general Denial. Because who's a judge going to believe? The witness who's an officer of the Metropolitan Police Department? Or, or this Vietnamese girl who just happened to be on 14th Street at 2 a.m. in the morning in hot pants, a bikini top, and stilettos? Give me a break. And my mother's watching me? I am going to let this whore have it. I'm now prosecuting a United States senator. So after practicing on the DC sex workers, addicts, and street thugs, I've graduated to the US Department Justice Public Integrity Section. Three years in, I'm assigned the biggest case of my career. Senator David Durenberg, Republican of Minnesota, has come up with this illegal scheme to get the government to pay his mortgage. Uh, we charge him with multiple felonies. It's one of the most important prosecutions in the Justice Department. And as a, a young lawyer, I'm lucky to be in the case. Uh, I'm the second chair. 
uh, the senior lawyer is a lot more experienced. Uh, if I just get to do uh, opening statement or closing statement, a couple of juicy cross-examinations, I'm good. Uh, this is the kind of high-profile case uh, that can make a lawyer's career. So life for this young member of the recent graduating class of Harvard Law School, life for this young prosecutor is sweet. And shortly before that case goes to trial, uh, I get arrested. Simple assault is the crime I'm accused of committing. Uh, there's nothing simple about simple assault. That's the joke that we made when we learned about how to prosecute that case uh, when I was a rookie prosecutor. Uh, what, what I didn't know then, uh, what I couldn't afford given the work I did to believe, is that there's nothing simple about any accusation of crime. I, I had to learn that the hard way. At, at the beginning of my trial, the trial where I'm the lead role, somebody else is the prosecutor. A, at the beginning of that trial, the, the judge told the jury, this is a case about a dispute between two people about a parking space. Neither one of them actually has a car. The jurors, they had their serious faces on them, but they kind of looked like they wanted to laugh. Mm, but it was true. When I left the law firm to go to the Justice Department, I took a big pay cut. I, I had to downgrade, so I moved to a, a kind of sketchy neighborhood not too far from downtown. And included in the rent was a parking space that I didn't need. Uh, I had a bike that I rode everywhere I went. So I had this bright idea. I rent out the parking space, bring in a little extra money every month. I noticed that there was a car that was always parked in the space. And I saw the guy who was parking there. That's my space, dude. He said, well, I'm renting it from a woman who, who lives over there. Uh, he said her name was Detroit. So uh, I knock on Detroit's door and, and tell her politely that I need the space. She says, it's her space. Uh, I put on my lawyer's voice and I show her the, the deed. I says, it's my space. She slams the door in my face. She's not going to stop me. I ran out the space. And, and I ran it out to this young social worker. And right away, Detroit starts, we think it's Detroit, starts leaving notes on, on Donna's car. And Donna says, I can, I can deal with this. But then Detroit starts making threats to Donna, and I know from my day job, that's a crime, making threats. Uh, but the threats are, are notes left on the car. I just want to catch her doing it, and then we can make the case. So uh, I start looking out my window at night, get a little obsessed with it. I'm a prosecutor, right? Just want to get a photo of her leaving one of these notes in the car. New apartment, it's being having my floors redone, there's all these bags of sawdust uh, that the workmen leave where we leave the garbage. One night, looking out at night, no notes. Wake up the next morning, first thing I do now is look out the window, see if we can catch Detroit. She's not there, but there's bags of sawdust all in Donna's car. I go outside to inspect. No one's around. Go to the front, Detroit's outside. She's sweeping something from her front yard, something that looks a lot like sawdust. I said, I'm calling the police. First, I want to go look at Donna's car to see if there's any damage. 
Uh, when I was in prosecutor rookie school, we were told that for whatever reason, DC police, they take car vandalism really seriously. The joke was, if, if your boyfriend is beating you up, don't call the police and say, he hit me and I hurt. Or call the police and say, somebody put sugar in my ignition, my gas tank. Cops will be there in two minutes. So I want to see if the car's OK. I'm looking at the car, and all of a sudden, there's no reason to call the police. They're there. Jump out the car. Motherfucker, you're under arrest. For what? Simple assault. That's crazy. What are you talking about? You pushed Detroit. You ran up to her and pushed her. That's crazy. Ask anybody in the neighborhood. Everyone knows she's, she's crazy. Cop sees me. Who else? You're under arrest. So I play my trump card. I say, I'm a prosecutor. I work for the United States Department of Justice. Uh, the cop says, so you probably know this already. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and be, will be used against you. Uh, he reads me my rights. So I'm, I'm handcuffed, I'm put in the back of the police car. Uh, I thought this cannot be happening. It felt like one of those dreams that professional people have where their most feared public humiliation comes true. So at the police station, that's where my privilege kicks back in. I actually know so many lawyers, it takes me a minute to figure out which one I'm going to call. So I, I call one of my buddies, and I'm now in the holding cell uh, at the courthouse. Uh, one of my friends comes and says that Michelle Roberts is going to represent me. She's now the executive director of the NBA Players Association. At that time, she's known as the best trial lawyer in DC. Uh, so. She comes at some point and says, I don't believe this, but they're going to prosecute this case. They're going to be arraigned in a few minutes. They probably won't ask for bail. Uh, let me do all the talking. So in arraignment, I'm thinking, oh my god, the judge is going to know me. It's going to be so embarrassing. She doesn't even look at me. I'm just one of 100 black men who are on the lockup list that day. Uh, a trial date is set. The judge orders me to stay away from Detroit. And, and finally, I'm free to, to, to leave. Uh, my lawyer gives me some money for a cab. Uh, I go home. And, and finally, in the privacy of my house, I cry. Next day at work is worse. Uh, I'm the only black male prosecutor in my office, and I'm the only person in the history of the section ever to have been arrested, everybody. Everybody knows. Uh, my, my boss at the Justice Department, he, he gets a call from uh, the US attorney for DC. He, he says, wasn't Paul the guy who, who prosecuted that guy in my office? And we had. I had. Uh, there was a, a guy in that office who was selling film, government film. And we set up a little sting operation where undercover film, undercover agent goes in and says, how much film you got? Guy says, how much you want? $50 worth. I got $100, $250. Me and my agent, we're watching this, and we're cracking up. Because every time it goes up, this guy gets more and more exposure, more time in prison. So finally, when he gets to the offers to sell the amount of film that he can get like 20 years in prison, uh, we send the other agents in to take this cretin. That's what we call defendants at the US Attorney's Office, cretins and douchebags. We send the agents in to put this cretin out of his misery. And we cracked up. 
And, and now the U.S. attorney is saying, I sure would like to have known about that case. It was embarrassing. So Paul prosecuted my guy. We're not dropping this case. So a, a lot more happens. Uh, I go to trial, finally. Uh, it, it takes the jury less than 10 minutes to find me not guilty. And, and the reason they found me not guilty is because, because I went to Harvard Law School, and we made sure they knew it, and I went to Yale. And the reason they found me not guilty is because uh, I had legal skills. I literally prosecuted people in, in the courtroom where I was being prosecuted. The reason they found me not guilty is because I had social standing. And the reason they found me not guilty is because I was innocent, but it didn't seem like the most important reason. Uh, people say, you should have known. Uh, oh, I had defendants, and I was a prosecutor. They say the cops planted the drugs, the cops are lying. I'm like, Mr. Jones, you mean this cop has nothing to do but make up shit about you? Uh, during my own trial, the cop got in the stand and, and made up shit about me. I don't know why he did it. Uh, but I've said that that experience, it, it made a man out of me, a black man. I feel connected to a lot of people. Uh, I learned a lot uh, that I, I needed to know. In, in the black church, they say uh, uh, a setback ain't nothing but a setup for a comeback. They love wordplay in the black church. I, I think that's where Kendrick Lamar gets it from. It, it's true, though, that the setback of getting arrested and prosecuted <clears throat> set me up for a teaching career, because I couldn't do that work anymore. They would have been happy to keep me. I couldn't do it anymore. Set me up for a teaching career that I've, I've loved and, and, and gave me the kind of insight that I was too proud to, to learn on my own. When people asked James Baldwin how it felt to be both black and gay, he said he felt like he hit the jackpot. He said, if you don't live the only life you have, it's not like you're going to live somebody else's life. You just won't live a life at all. So why be normal? Be subversive. Be queer in one way or another. Celebrate how you are different from every other sentient being on this planet. Uh, that's your gift to the world, and especially uh, with this pedigree, you're going to have lots of opportunities to share that gift. In the words of the poet Nikki Giovanni, turn yourself into yourself. Uh, when I started teaching, I had to find something to write about. Scholarship is the coin of the realm. Uh, but I hadn't been on the law review here. And I had a first-rate education. But I took a lot of clinical classes, so I didn't do a lot of paper writing. Uh, but for all of my favorite articles that I've written as a scholar, I've written them by going the way that my blood beats. Uh, my first ex big article was based on my experience as a prosecutor. Uh, we're also in rookie prosecutor school, we were told that sometimes jurors would know that a guy was guilty. But if it was a young black man and it was a minor crime, a drug crime, those jurors were not going to send that man to jail. Even though they knew that he was guilty, they would find him not guilty. And so when I started teaching, I wanted to learn more about that process. Found out it's perfectly constitutional, call it jury nullification. It's a, a way that DC jurors responded uh, when their young people were called douchebags and cretins. It was a way of walking up to the office that called them that and slapping that office in the face. First book, Let's Get Free, A Hip-Hop Theory of Justice. I, I fell in love with hip-hop in New York in the 1980s, uh, when hip-hop was being born in the boogie down Bronx. Uh, years later, when I started teaching, I learned the philosophy and theories of punishment. 
and, and it resonated, those theories, with what the artists were laying down on tracks. And I didn't know anybody else who could connect Immanuel Kant to Jay-Z, uh, Lil' Kim to Foucault. And, and so that's the book that I wrote. That's the book that you have in you, the dots that only you can connect. Uh, going the way your blood bleeds, beats will always lead you to the right place. And, and bring your, your people with you. My mom, she lives in Las Vegas, and she's flying all the way here to attend my last criminal law class tomorrow. She says she wants to see me teach at Harvard. Uh, I said, you see me teach at Georgetown, you see me teach at George Washington, it's the same class she said, yeah, I know, but this is Harvard. Uh, she said, I, I had you when you were 17 years, when I was 17 years old, and now you're teaching at Harvard. I want to see it. So, you know, it's section seven. They've been together for the whole year, so it's going to be a little bit embarrassing with my mom sitting right there tomorrow. Uh, but I have to let her come, right? Point by Alice Walker gets it right. They were women then my mother's generation. Husky of voice, stout of step with fist as well as hands, how they battered down doors. And ironed starch white shirts, how they led armies, head racked generals across minefields, booby trap ditches to discover books, desk, a place for us. How they knew what we must know without knowing a page of it themselves. Uh, I think third-year law students uh, get way too hung up on what their first job is going to be after law school. Relax, it's not that serious. Uh, very few of my friends are doing practicing even in the same areas they started out in. Doesn't mean they made a mistake. It just means that the world changed and they changed. It's all good. Just a couple of quick final thoughts. Now, some people say that what you learn in law school is how to think like a lawyer. Uh, growing up on the south side of Chicago, uh, I didn't go to law school to learn how to think like a lawyer. Uh, I went to law school to learn how to kick a lawyer's ass. Uh, lawyer thinking had caused my friend's father to lose his pension after working 30 years for the same company. Lawyer thinking was why the toxic waste dump was in my neighborhood. Lawyer thinking had created a, a community where I could walk for blocks and blocks and never see a white person in a city that was majority white. Uh, what you wrote in your admissions essay about why you want to go to Harvard Law School, I hope that gets you in trouble with the king. Uh, it might lead to some lonely places. Sometimes I wonder what Constance Baker Motley must have thought when she was working with Thurgood Marshall, try to defeat Jim Crow. But Mary Bonato must have felt in 1997 in Vermont when these two women walked in her office and said they wanted to get married, and she lost in Vermont. But then she won in Massachusetts and Connecticut and Maine, and, and right before uh, the 1L year of the class of 2018, she won in the Supreme Court of the United States. So get in trouble with the king, and sometimes the king might actually be orthodox thinking about what it means to be a progressive or a conservative. God bless the Me Too movement. I wish it had been around for some of the women in my life who had to leave jobs or who had their career stunted because of men who harassed them. They felt like they had no recourse because nobody with power believed them or nobody with power cared. Uh, I hope that many of you will use your, your skills as Harvard-trained lawyers to crush that system, that patriarchy, so that women will not be doubted simply because they are women. Also, from my own prosecution, I, I learned that sometimes people accuse other people of doing things that they <laughs> did not do. Not all the time. Not even, I think, most of the time, but some of the time. And so as lawyers, we should be the first to insist on due process, on fair hearings, on thoughtful adjudication. Uh, 
Think of what's happened, class of 2018, during your time here. Uh, right before you arrived, I mentioned the Supreme Court decided Ober Obergelfil versus Hodges. Uh, the cops killed during the time you've been here. Alton Sterling, Walter Scott, Philando Castile, to Cynthia Clements. Here at the law school, the black tape incident, the takeover of Belinda, uh, the lo new law school crest, the bicentennial, the dedication of the monument to the enslaved persons who made it possible for us all to be in this room now. Uh, on the national scene, just during your time here, the election of Donald Trump, the Me Too movement, uh, the movement for black lives, the dreamers, uh, the kingdom that you're getting the keys to is a dangerous place for most of its inhabitants. It's getting more and more dangerous. What are you going to do about it? Uh, sometimes I, I wonder if I had been a, uh, what I would have done back in the day. Like if, if I had been a, a slave, I hope I would have been a runaway. I hope I would have been one of those people who led the uprisings. If I'd been around back during the Civil Rights Movement, I hope I would have been one of those people who sat in at the lunch counters. Uh, I hope I would have been one person who, like my mom, took it to the streets with Malcolm. If you, like me, wonder what you would have done back in the day, ask yourselves, what are you doing right now? Uh, what are you doing with those keys to the kingdom? There's some good you can do. The African-American men who got tortured in Chicago, who got those settlements, lawyers did that. Uh, the same sex couples who wanted to get married, lawyers did that. So for black people who keep getting killed by the police, what can lawyers do? You tell me. You let me know. Five years. The transgender women of color. Uh, female associates who keep getting harassed by a male partner, but they want to make partner. Uh, the influence of, of corporate money or Vladimir Putin on US elections, the poison water in Flint, the occupied territories in Palestine, what can lawyers do? Uh, I'm going to wait to hear from you. You let me know. Uh, there's a wonderful documentary called Street Fight. Uh, it's about when Cory Booker first ran for office for mayor of Newark, New Jersey. And the documentary shows this campaign rally. And this little girl, about eight years old, she's being interviewed. And she seems so excited. And, and the interviewer says, did you see Cory Booker? And the little girl says, yeah. And she says, and I smelled him. <laughs> and, and the interviewer says, well, what did he smell like? And the little girl pauses. And she said, he smells like the future. Uh, people of the class of 2018, uh, what an honor it's been to teach many of you and to speak to all of you today. Uh, you smell like the future. Be careful with it, the future. And your keys to it, remember this woman. Her name is Leisha Evans, and this is a photo of her being arrested for protesting the killing of Alton Sterling. Uh, a black man who was killed by the police. Uh, she was 35 years old when this photo was taken, a licensed practical nurse, and I, I think a, a superhero. She stood in the face of power, brave and strong and probably a little bit scared. And nevertheless, she resisted. Well, what are you going to resist? Uh, my career has been about resisting uh, our criminal legal process. Uh, when Clarence Thomas was a judge in DC, he said sometimes he used to look out the window of his chambers and he'd see all of these young black men filing the, to criminal court in chains, and he would think there but for the grace of God go I. President Obama, speaking at the NAACP convention, same phrase, there but for the grace of God go I. Uh, uh, my fellow members of the Harvard Law School community, the determination of who goes to criminal court in chains should not be so fortuitous. Uh, how well you do in this country, in this world, 
should not depend so much on, on race and class and gender. As long as it does, we need all of you uh, to use the opportunities and the blessings that you got here, uh, to use your keys to the kingdom to resist. Uh, thank you to the class marshals for giving me this privilege of, of speaking with you today. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, to the class of 2018, congratulations. Yeah, I, I, I got a class, so I have a class. So. Yeah, why don't we let's get this.